In this video, I'll cover the Year 9 Nonlinear Algebra Applications Preview. So these are the A and B level questions. I'll put some time tags in the description below so you can skip to question numbers and question types. Question 1, we're solving equations. And these really are just balance method questions, these ones. So we're going to get rid of that 7 first. It says to add it, so I'll take 7 from both sides. That's going to leave me the square root of 6c equaling 3. Don't really want to know what um, the square root of 6c is, so I'm going to get rid of that square root next. Best thing to do to get rid of that is to square both sides. So we're doing this kind of thing, if that makes sense. I don't think I've ever written this before in a balance method question, but I'm going to square both sides, and so I'm going to end up with 6c left on the left, and this will become 3 squared, which is 9. And then I'm going to divide by 6 both sides to get rid of that 6. And my final answer will be a fraction, which is going to be 9 on 6. And I can simplify that to 3 on 2. Or you might choose to answer that as 1 and a half. Either of those answers would be fine. Next one. I'm going to get rid of that minus 3 first. It's times minus 3, so I'm going to divide both sides by minus 3. I'll take the negative as well as the 3, and so I'll end up with m squared on the left, and I'll end up with minus 4 on the right. It's supposed to be a 4, it's not a very neat 4. It's telling me to square, so the opposite to what we did in the first question, I'm going to square root both sides because that will get rid of that squared. So I'll end up with m, and on this side, I'll end up with the square root of minus 4. Let's stop for a minute. You can't do that, okay? There's no such thing as the square root of a negative number. There's no solution to this, because any number multiplied by itself will give you a positive answer. So the answer to this one is no solution which seems a bit strange, but in time that will make sense when we get to the graphing. And last one. We'll have to get rid of that square root first, so let's square both sides. That means that I'll have 25 on this side, because 5 squared is 25, and on this side I'll have 7 minus 5x. Next I'll target that 7, it's a positive number, so I'll take 7 from both sides. That means that on the left I'll have 18, touch screen's really starting to struggle, and on this side I'll have minus 5x. Now I'll target that minus 5, it says the times minus 5, so I'm going to divide by negative 5 on both sides. And my final answer will be that 18 over negative 5 equals x. Question 2. We need to factorise and we need to use the null factor method. So we did a little bit of factorising in the fundamentals video, so I won't talk about it for too long. But remember, I need the factors of 18 that are going to make 7. So I've got... 1 and 18, 2 and 9, and I've got 3 and 6. So 2 and 9 are probably looking pretty good. And the next thing I do is I have a look at this symbol. That one's negative. So that means that when I go to form my factorised equation, I know it's going to be C something times C something. And because... This little symbol here is negative, that means I'm going to have a plus and a minus. And so if I have a look at the factors, I'm going to target 9 and 2. I'm trying to make positive 7, so 9 minus 2 makes 7, and I'm factorised. Now, null factor law is just that C is the same numbers but the opposite symbols, so minus 9, and it's also 2. That's two answers. 
Remember we went back and had a quick look at that, so don't write this. This is just the proof, okay, so that you understand. If I made c minus 9, then I'd end up with, if I rewrote this equation, I'd end up with minus 9 plus 9, so 0, times minus 9 minus 2, minus 11, in other words, makes nothing, and we know that that's right, because anything times 0 is 0, hence null factor law. We're trying to make one of the factors nothing. And also if we made it 2, then we'd end up with 2 plus 9, which is positive 11, but that doesn't really matter, does it? Because 2 minus 2 in the second bracket makes nothing. And so that's why it works. So this is our final answer, and there's no need to write this, okay? Let's keep going. Second example, I want some factors of 32 that are going to make 12. So let's write them down. I've got 1 and 32. I've got 2 and 16. I've got 4 and 8. It's probably more, but I can already see that um, 4 and 8 are probably going to do the job to make 12 for me. So let's have a look at setting this up. This is going to be x something times x something when I factorise it. And I'm also looking at this little symbol here. It's a plus, so a positive, so both symbols in the brackets will be the same. And this tells me they're both going to be positive. So now I'm just looking for two factors I can add together to make 12. 4 and 8 will work, so I've got 4 and 8. So my final answer is that x is minus 4, and it's also minus 8. Next one. All right, this one's a perfect square. Straight away I'm noticing that something's missing in the middle here, isn't it? I don't have a value in front of x or m in this case. I've got an m squared and I've got a number at the end. Often when you see these, you'll notice that this number here can be uh, square rooted if it was positive. So, you know, the square root of 81 is 9. So what's going to happen with this one is we can just jump straight to, I know it's going to be m, m. The same rule applies. This one is a negative, so I know I'm going to have a plus and a minus. And because that number in the middle is missing, I know these are going to be the same answer, the same number. So it's going to be plus or minus 9. Okay. And if we expanded this out, that would work. Remember, we'd have, don't write this line again, okay? Just remember, it's, it would be m squared, ah, sorry, minus 9m, plus 9m, minus 81. And those would cancel one another, which is why we'd end up with the question at the top. So that's nice and easy. Our answer to this one is, oops, I'll write that in blue, is that m equals positive or negative 9, or you might decide to write that as m equals 9 and minus 9. Your choice, whichever you'd prefer. Both are correct. Okay, next one. This one's got a 5 in front of the x squared. That always makes things a little bit trickier if you're not careful. So I think what I would do to start this one is I would get rid of that 5. So if both numbers are divisible by 5, do that. Let's get 5 out of that so we don't have to deal with it. The 5 can just float out the front there. Now, if you have a look at that closely, that's very similar to the last question that we just did. It's missing a value in front of x. It's missing its b value, in other words. And I know that if I took positive 9, if I square rooted it, I'd get 3. So this is another one of those perfect squares. So this one can be written like this. Just let the 5 float down the front. It's not going to do any harm out there. You'll have x something, x something. I can see that this is negative, so I'm going to have a plus and a minus. And then if I look for factors of 9 that are the same, 3 and 3 and that would expand back out to make this one if need be. So here we go, that means that x is plus or minus 3. 
or you can write it like we did last time x is 3 and it's also minus 3 so the 5 out the front if it's concerning you just remember once we make either this factor or this factor 0 it's not going to make an ounce of difference having the 5 out the front because it's going to be being multiplied by nothing so you'll ultimately end up with the answer nothing which is what you're looking for anyway next one let's factorize this one as well looking for factors of 22 again and i'm going to try and make it 13 out of them so i've got 1 and 22 i've got 2 and 11 that one's looking pretty good for making 13 so let's start forming up our factorized equation so it's going to be p something times p something equals nothing i'm having a look at this symbol it's a plus so they're both going to be the same as in the symbol in each set of brackets is going to be the same and this one tells me they're both going to be negative so i've got minus 2 minus 11 which does make minus 13 so we factorize this null factor p is going to be 2 and it's also going to be 11 and we've answered that one as well last one we've got factors of 20 and we're trying to make one remember there's a little one in front of that x there so i've got one and 20 that definitely won't work two and ten that's not going to work four and five that could work for us couldn't it so let's have a look we'll form up our factorized equation i've got an x and something i've got an x and something and i've got a negative here so that means i'm going to have a plus and a minus and so how can I use 4 and 5 to make 1? I can say 5 minus 4 makes 1. We're all done. So we just need to, uh, to, to finalise the answer. So null factor says that x is going to be minus 5. And it's also going to be positive 4. And we've finished that one. Question 3. We need to find the equation of the quadratic picture. Now... This is where we're going to introduce the turning point form. So we call that TP form. Form's not short for formula, okay? It's form as in a format. So when you see the equations or quadratic equations, they'll come in three different forms. They'll come in expanded form. So if we take a couple of examples here, this is expanded form this is factorized form which is what we turned it into but turning point form looks like this y equals a x plus b all squared plus c now occasionally these letters change so You'll see in some of our sheets here actually that we use H and T instead just so they don't get confusing. But a lot of formula sheets have got A and B, oh sorry, this B and C here on them. So I'll stick with that for the purposes of this just so that it hopefully matches your formula sheet. But the position of those numbers does the same thing. So there's no need to stress out about it. Now, if we have a look at this quadratic over on the left here this point down here is the point that it turns so up until that point it's been heading down and then it hits this point and it turns and it starts heading up which is why it's called a turning point another name for it is also the stationary point but that's the one that we're most interested in this one right here and we need to know what the coordinates of this are so they are at 1, 2, 3, minus 3, 1, 2, 3, 4, minus 4. And this is what we're going to use to create our formula. So we're going to go in to the formula up here. And it's going to look like this. Y equals, we won't know what A is yet. We'll test for that in a minute. X. And then the B value is the X value of the turning point 
but you have to reverse the symbol. So it's a minus 3, so here it becomes a plus 3. You have to remember to reverse it because it's going into the bracket, so it's like doing the reverse of null factor, okay? And then the C value on the end is there as it stands. And often when I teach this, so again, I'm going away from your formula sheet, I'll change the formula a bit and I'll teach this so that it's X minus V. That way, hopefully you remember when you sub it in to reverse the symbol. So you've got to be a little bit careful with this. Lots of teachers will teach this different ways. So my preferred way of teaching it is to give you this modified formula here so that in particular you remember here that you've got to swap this symbol. If you can remember how it works, you'll be fine. Okay, so now we've got that written. and It's likely that um, A is probably going to be 1 anyway, but just in case, we better check. So we need to take another point on the line. Any point will be fine. So I might choose this point here, and I'm going to say that one's minus 1, 0. I'm choosing that one because it's got nice low numbers, and so that's an x, y point. So just to check that a is in fact 1, I'm going to solve for a now, okay? So wherever I see a y, I'm going to replace it with a 0, so that's this 0 here, and whenever I see an x, I'll replace it with this minus 1. So I'll rewrite this equation, so I've got 0 equals a, which I still don't know, minus 1, plus 3, all squared, minus 4. And so we've got 0 equals A outside of minus 1 plus 3 makes 2, and 2 squared is 4. So I've got 4 A's, and then I've got minus 4. All right, balance method. Let's add 4 to both sides, I'll end up with 4 equals 4a, divide by 4 both sides, wow, that's going a bit bad, isn't it? And so a is 1, fantastic, let's write out our final equation, so I go back to here where I've been building the equation, and now I know what my A is, so my final answer will be Y equals 1, which I usually don't bother writing, but I'll just put in orange there so you know where it went. X plus 3, all squared, minus 4. And that is my final answer. Ordinarily, you wouldn't bother writing the 1 in there, so you can take that out. Okay, so that's your final answer there. Let's do the second one. Not very much room here, is there? Okay, remember I'm looking for the turning point, so I'm going to use the turning point form again. So I'm going to use my version of it. Turning point form is y equals a x minus b all squared plus c. And so now I sub in the values, so let's work out what that point is. That point there is at 1, 2, 3, 4, 2. All right, let's sub in. So we've got y equals a outside of, oops, 4x. And my B value, instead of being positive 4, becomes minus 4 squared. And my positive 2 remains a positive 2 on the end. Now I am going to just check that A is 1, or test for A. So I'll take another point on this line. Let's take this one up here. Let's just assume it actually hits that point. This one's going to be 6. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 6. So we've got the point 6, 6. And we'll sub that in. So 6 equals A outside of 6 minus 4, all squared, plus 2. And so 6 equals 6 minus 4 is 2, and 2 squared is 4. So this one will become 4A 
equal oops plus two on the end doing some funny things here okay balance method take two away from both sides I'll end up with four over here and four a here divide by four both sides and I'll end up with a being one again great let's go back grab the formula that we're starting to form here put in a and we'll have our written formula so this one will be y equals one which again we normally wouldn't bother writing we've got x minus four all squared plus two and this is our final answer unless the question states it there's no need to turn this into expanded or factorized form all you're doing is creating more work and time for yourself so it's fine in turning point form question four we're going to complete the table and we're going to graph the equation okay a little bit like in the fundamentals test i like to start this at zero and the other thing is if you've got a calculator with you do yourself a favor and set your calculator screen up so that it does all the hard work for you so we've got three times something squared minus three and then what you can do is just keep changing the x value so remember that these tables work like this it's saying what is y when x is this number and so we've got to test each of them so we'll start with when x is nothing and all you need to do is hit equals on your calculator and then skip back and change the zero to the other numbers I like to start in the middle because it's probably going to be a reflection at this level so that means it's going to be zero squared is nothing and three times nothing is nothing so y will be minus three let's change it to one one squared is one one times three is three and three minus three makes nothing now I'll test two 2 squared is 4, 3 times 4 is 12, and 12 minus 3 makes 9. And the others will just be a reflection of this, okay? So you can cheat and just skip ahead, but in the interest of doing this properly, 1 squared is 1, 3 times 1 is 3, and 3 minus 3 makes nothing. Minus 2, 3, uh, sorry, minus 2 squared is 4. 3 times 4 is 12, 12 minus 3 is 9. And so we've got our values, and now all I've got to do is plot them on the axis over here. Be careful. Remember to label each axis with a scale and mark in the key points. So we need to put in key points here. Let's make sure that we do that. This is my y-axis. This is my x-axis. This can be positive 10, positive 10, negative 10 negative 10 and let's put our points in so i've got the first one at 0 minus 3 x before y remember so this one's 0 minus 3 i've got the next one at 1 0 i would call this a significant point because it crosses the x-axis i've got another one at 2 9 i wouldn't particularly consider that significant so i'll Put the dot there but i'm not going to bother to label that one i've got one at minus one zero that's definitely significant because it crosses the x-axis so i'll label it and i've got another one at minus two nine and then freehand no rulers please you're going to come in and sketch the neatest line that you can It's very tall and skinny. I would have expected that because of this three here. Okay, that controls the pinch of the line. Okay, so how tightly it turns. In other words, the bigger that number, the tighter the curve will turn. And just if I had a really tough marker, the other thing I might do is I might also label this line just so I don't lose any marks and you might notice as well I put arrows on the end of each of those lines because they go on for infinity they never stop question five we've got a worded one so this is a bit more like a real world question here so we've got a creek over here and h is the height above sea level so we're going to um, know that 
this line here, the x-axis, this is this is sea level, okay? And so anything above it is uh, is above sea level. Anything below is obviously below sea level. So let's have a look at um, what we need to do. We've got a formula for it sitting up here. And D is the distance from the edge of the creek. Okay, how high is the creek bank above sea level? We can actually just count for this. Um, so let's do that literally. We've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. It's seven meters above sea level. So, worded question, technically a worded answer. It is seven meters above sea level. It would be great if you could actually do this algebraically. It would show that you've got a strong understanding of this, and we need to use the constant to show that. You can actually see here that the graph starts um, in the positive here, it starts where, where x is zero, okay, it, the, the creek actually starts. So we could make x zero and that would prove the height, okay. So if we took the formula h equals d squared minus 8d plus 7, and we recognize that d is zero, okay. That's where the creek is set at its maximum height above sea level. And we can just go in with h equals 0 squared minus 8 times nothing plus 7. And we can see quite clearly that h equals 7. Because nothing squared is nothing and 8 times nothing is nothing. So all that's left is positive 7. So... That, oops, that demonstrates that we know how to do it algebraically as well. Okay, at two metres from the edge, how high is it above sea level? Um, right, that's easy enough. Let's do that. We'll write out a formula again. So we've got the formula H equals D squared minus 8D plus 7. And this time the distance is two metres, okay? So what happens at two meters, we'll sub it in, the height will be two squared minus eight times two plus seven. And so we pop that into our calculator or we work it out ourselves. What have we got here? We've got uh, four minus 16 plus seven, which gives us the answer minus five. Minus five is interesting, isn't it? If it's at minus 5, it's below sea level. And we can see that here. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. That's that point right there. Okay. So the answer is at 2 metres from the edge, the creek is 5 metres below sea level. And last question. How far from the edge is the creek at sea level? Use the equation to find your solution. So this time we're substituting, but we are making h0 because we want a height of nothing so if h equals 0 and we're using the formula um, h equals d squared minus 8d plus 7 just remember this is quadratics this test so we're probably going to end up with two answers we're going to end up with whatever this point is and whatever this point is we can count for it but i we should be showing this algebraically because this is a um, applications test. So let's solve this using the null factor. So if h is 0, then I've got d squared minus 8d plus 7. And all I'm going to do now is I'm just going to shift that 0 to the other end so it looks like all the other questions that we've been doing during this. So it doesn't get confusing. I'm looking for factors of 7 that are going to make 8. So my factors of 7 are quite easy. They're 1 and 7. We're going to somehow have to make that equal 8. I know that my formula is going to change to something like this in factorized form. 
or my equation rather. So now I'm having a look at this little symbol here and it's a plus, so that means I've got a positive, oh, hang on a second, it's a positive, so they're both going to be the same. And this one tells me they're both going to be negatives. Okay, that's where I'll get that from. I've got 1 and 7, so I'll chuck them in and see what happens. Minus 1, minus 7 does make minus 8. So fantastic, we've got the answer. So no effect of all. Distance will be 1 metre and it will be at 7 metres. And again, we're going to want a worded answer. And that might be something like... The creek is at sea level at both 1 and 7 metres from its edge. Now the beauty with this question too is you can quickly just actually check to make sure that you've got this right. And look, it did happen at 1 just here and it did happen here at 7 as well. So we know we've got full marks for this question.